Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash historyfangirl. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. My guest today is Megan Starr. She is the travel writer behind the website meganstar.com. And you may remember she came on and talked about the 20th century history of Kiev in the, in Ukraine. And today we're going to talk about um, something that is a very similar topic, but something that is a way less known in the outside world, which is the Great Famine of Kazakhstan. Hi, Megan. Hi. Thanks for having me again. So the cool thing is that Megan and I are actually sitting in Almaty, uh, Kazakhstan. We're sitting at the base of this beautiful but very sad monument. And we apologize this episode was going to come out last week, but we both got this terrible flu that's going around uh, Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. So we couldn't talk until yesterday. Um, So thank you guys for your patience. But we really wanted to record this episode uh, at the site of the monument because just there's there's nobody here. Nobody knows about this monument. Very few people outside of Kazakhstan know about this tragedy. So what why don't you tell us a little bit about like where we are sitting? Okay, so we are actually sitting um, in a park that's at the intersection of Kaban Bai Batir and Nauriz Bai uh, Batir. Um, the park itself isn't very large, uh, and it's a little bit hidden under pine trees. It's actually known for its pine trees. But in this park, just recently, they unveiled a monument to the um, the victims for the genocide uh, or the famine. Uh, it's known either as the Great Kazakh Famine or the Goloshenkin Genocide, um, either or. But in reality, not many people actually know that it took place in the first place. So this ties in with the last episode. So I'm doing, and I have another episode about the World Nomad Games that will come out soon. But uh, last week we talked, or last episode we talked about um, these nomadic peoples that lived in the steppe and how their traditions are still alive. But uh, not a lot of people know about the process that the Soviet Union used to um, bring them under control. A lot of people know that the Soviet Union tried to and well, successfully uh, got rid of many of the Ukrainians that were in Ukraine so that they could be in control of Ukraine. But that process happened in multiple parts of the Soviet Union. Um, and it happened here, but it wasn't that it didn't happen to the, like the peasant farmers here. It happened to uh, the nomadic peoples here. So if you think about the descendants of Genghis Khan, like what happened to them in the 20th century, uh, some, some, for some people, it's that the computer and modernization changed the way they needed to live. But for a lot, it's that the Soviet Union came in and forced them into submission and, and just at times got rid of them. So what, what was Kazakhstan like at the, in the beginning of the 20th century and kind of what was the process that led to this famine? So Kazakhstan, a lot of people don't realize this, actually was um, completely nomadic at the beginning of that century for the most part. Um, people that weren't completely nomadic were seasonally nomadic. Um, so the there was no infrastructure here that would have been um, worth anybody being here. Um, however, there was a lot of uh, wildlife and a lot of um, livestock that did exist here, which made it a very opportune place for the Soviets, um, you know, coming in here. So, uh, you know, given the the space that exists here, um, the people, the different lifestyle, um, while that was kind of what ended up being wiped out, that was kind of the lure of uh, people coming in here in the first place. So when the Soviet Union wanted to be in control of Kazakhstan, they were, they, Russians were the ethnic minority here. What, what was the, what mechanisms did they actually do to change that? 
Um, so, you know, 90% of the livestock for the Soviet Union actually existed here in Kazakhstan. Um, so it was a very fruitful opportunity for them. However, um, they, that is a little bit more of a challenging process to feed people in, in some weird way. Um, and they looked at everything as kind of like, okay, let's collectivize um, all of the, uh, the farms here and make it so that it could have been like more dispersed to the people. Um, so this actually, there weren't there wasn't just one genocide that took place here. There were two. Uh, the one that we're going to be speaking mostly about was the second one, but the first one happened in 1919. And um, this was kind of what kind of kicked things off. And it happened here and in Kyrgyzstan and in Turkestan, which was another um, republic in the area at the time. And um, it ended up about 400,000 to 750,000 peasants died as a result of um, droughts and the failures of collectivization and um, things like that. And uh, so it was kind of something that had already killed off, unfortunately, about 19 to 33 percent, somewhere in there, of the Kazakh population uh, before the second one even started. So in Ukraine, the famine was a lot about taking these collectivized farms, shipping all of the food to Russia and not letting the Ukrainians eat. What does a famine of livestock look like? A famine of livestock just means that if you're collectivizing the farms, you're taking people away from their nomadic lifestyle. Um, 90% of uh, what's actually out there is going to perish. Um, so by putting these people into situations that they were not able to thrive by farming and things like that, um, you're automatically reducing their knowledge and the way that they go about their everyday life anyways. Um, so it ended up in like mass, mass um, genocide. So the question for a lot of people is, not a lot of modern people, but the question through time was kind of, is this a famine or is this a genocide and what's the difference? Like, how do historians, like, how do they come to classify this specifically as a genocide and what did it do to the population? Um, quite frankly, I see it as a genocide, given that the government, um, this was under Stalin, um, was familiar with what happened from the start of it. Um, and it wasn't until so the second one that um, that happened was actually started in about 1931 and went until 1933. And it wasn't until the end of 1933 when they had already lost um, nearly two million people in the population. That's an, a rough estimate. It may have actually been more or very slightly less. They'd already lost that many people um, to starvation and to different, you know, um, dying for different reasons, where they even said, all right, maybe we should do something about this. So um, the reason they call it also the Goloshenkin genocide is because he was the one who was put in charge of everything. It was Philip uh, Goloshenkin um, of the Soviet Union. He was put in charge of this whole collectivization process. Um, so they tie it to him, but I mean, he was directly under Stalin. Stalin has proved to be completely aware of what took place and did nothing about it for multiple years until it actually killed off um, a great deal of the population here. And um, a lot of people don't realize this because there's not a lot of talk about this genocide specifically, especially in comparison to the Ukrainian one. But more Kazakhs died as, a, um, as an ethnicity than any other ethnicity that died during any of the famines and genocides. So while the Ukrainian genocide took more lives, the Kazakh genocide had a greater effect in terms of wiping out the population. Not that, not to compare genocides in terms of like a value statement for just to, so that you guys can kind of understand, like think about if that percentage of your population was wiped out, what it takes to come back from that. And um, this is just something that happened to nomadic peoples across the centuries and across the world too. It seems like, if you think about like what happened in the Americas, if you think about what happened to like, and even still is happening to nomadic Chinese people and even non nomadic Chinese, but people from the same general, like central Asian ethnic groups, like the Uyghurs in China, just governments have a really hard time with groups that don't want to stay in one place and be registered at what address and fit into their like other, like, so, um, when you think about like nomadic ways of life and what the world nomad games was celebrating, a lot of the times that was taken like that. Those things were changed because governments decided that they were going to change and not because the people wanted to live different lives, which is just really sad. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the statue that we're sitting under? 
So the statue is about three meters high, and it actually shows a lady um, who is emaciated holding her son. Um, and the reason it was actually placed where it was here is because this is right by the um, old KGB headquarters here in Almaty. Um, so it sits in the middle of a park. It's very hidden. Um, there are some flower beds around it. And um, it's, quite frankly, if you know nothing about the genocide and you're not seeking it out proactively, you would never, ever stumble across it and think anything of it. Um, it's got the years on it, and it's got a quote by the current president of um, Kazakhstan, and he's been the president since 1990, even before the Soviet Union um, <laughs> dissolved, um, but he's got a quote beside it. And this was just um, came out to the public just recently um, on May 31st, uh, last year in 2017. So May 31st um, in post-Soviet countries, especially this one, is the day of remembrance of victims of political repression. Okay. So that is why it was actually unveiled on May 31st last year. Um, unfortunately, Nazarbayev, um, the president of Kazakhstan, did not appear um, for the unveiling of it. Okay. And yeah. So after the genocide, what was life like in Kazakhstan? Because, OK, so when I think of, when I think a lot of Westerners think about what life was like in the Soviet Union, I think they picture Moscow, St. Petersburg, Maybe they picture gulags. Maybe they picture Ukraine and Belarus. But um, at least for me, just talking about my personal biases, what happened in the Caucasus and in Central Asia just didn't... Russia was too... Like, the Soviet Union was too big of a place for me to really think about how life in each of these places was different. Now, traveling around them and seeing how different the cultures are in each of these places, it's it's crazy to think of that I ever thought of them as a monolith. But what was life like in Kazakhstan after the famine during the Soviet Union? Um, so after the famine, it uh, this place developed and it developed pretty quickly. So um, everything that you pretty much see here in Almaty today is a result of um, being built by the Soviet Union. So it's a really interesting city where it's got a bit of like kind of layers of architecture. So you can see what was built during the Soviet times. Some of it has a bit of a nomadic um aesthetic to it um just for details and and design um but then you can also see what's been you know popping up since uh the dissolution of the soviet union but um speaking of like the city itself or the country the kazakhs actually became a minority in their own country um after the genocide which is a very fascinating thing because this happened in the 30s in the early 30s and it wasn't until the 1990s after after the dissolution of the soviet union that they regained majority status in the city um so it's it really kind of details how wiped out that one um ethnicity was in their own um homeland so uh the germans there were a lot of Germans that were sent here um, after World War II, put in gulags. Um, they were allowed back into Germany after the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So um, that helps bring the population back up of the Kazakhs. Um, and then also the Russians that decided to retreat back to Russia after the dissolution. Um, so it wasn't that the Kazakhs were um, breeding, you know, ex you know, heavily or anything like that. It was more just that other people left, um, putting them back in a majority status. So in Ukraine, one of the things that the Soviet Union did was they tried to get rid of the Ukrainian language and pretend like these people were actually just Russians. They tried to pretend like the Belarusians were just Russians and that like nobody ever shouldn't have been Russians. I think one of the things that people maybe don't understand about the Soviet East is that you're talking about people that to an American would just look like they were from Asia. It's really easy to tell when you're talking to somebody who's ethnically Russian or ethnically Kazakh, whatever language they're speaking here. How, what was life like for Kazakhs in the Soviet Union? Because it wasn't like the Soviet Union was trying to pretend they were Russians and ethnically Russian. Yeah, so, I mean, um, it, it undermined the people here. They There was always a stigma here, and it still kind of exists today, that the people um, that are Kazakh, who come from the nomadic lifestyle originally, um, are not as intelligent. They're lazier, um, which I can't figure that one out, because, you know, I mean, <laughs> I've spent some time on this step, and I can't imagine that that's a lazy lifestyle. Um, but it's it was really something that um, kind of took a toll on the people as a whole, um, and all these, like, ideas were planted in their head that their language wasn't good enough, their lifestyle wasn't good enough. Their traditions weren't good enough. So, um, you know, this became a Russian speaking area. Uh, still today, you'll hear, in my opinion, in Almaty, a lot more Russian than you'll hear Kazakh. Um, it's not usually 
that you hear Kazakh until you get into the villages or into like the western part of the country or down into Shimkent, which is near the border of Uzbekistan. Um, so, I mean, the government currently is taking strides to um, reintroduce the Kazakh language into being more of the prominent language here. But I mean, you know, it's going to take generations for that to really come about. So in Ukraine, the famine is talked about a lot and it's talked about a lot as a point of contention between the Soviet Union or between uh, Ukraine and Russia. And it's also just talked about as an important marker in Ukrainian history. Why is Kazakhstan shyer to talk about what happened and why, like, why are we sitting under one small monument with very few books written about this, with very few people aware of it instead of like, what's the difference between Ukraine and Kazakhstan in terms of like why they talk about it so differently? I think there's a couple of reasons. I think like one of the main reasons um, that I've kind of searched in and figured out uh, things with were was with the Ukrainian one. Um, there's a lot of Ukrainians living in North America and they're not shy to speak about it. And they usually left because of uh, political repression or, or of something of that sort. So they never had a problem voicing um, what had happened there. Um, so if you go to see who's searching every month, uh, that genocide specifically in the, um, it, I mean, it's thousands and thousands of people. Uh, this one, you go to see who's searching about it and it's very Virtually nobody is searching for it from an English uh, point of view. Uh, I think the reason it's kind of um, been a bit uh, difficult here to get this known is because... uh, in my opinion, the current government really hasn't made it a priority to get it known. And there's not a whole lot of Central Asians that um, have migrated to the U.S. A lot of them have actually migrated up to Russia. Um, so this, the ties with Russia here are a lot stronger um, still currently today than obviously um, Ukraine, especially given the current situation. Uh, so it's just never been something that's been made a huge deal of. But it's also, um, you know, there was nothing really here prior to the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union in a lot of the people's eyes here built this entire city, built the infrastructure. So when you see something like that, a lot of people don't acknowledge that um, it actually had a hindrance. They think that maybe in some weird way that it actually kind of moved people forward um, into a different type of lifestyle that made it a bit more of a modern place and livable place. So Kazakhstan is a country that you've fallen in love with. Um, This is my first trip here. I really like... I'll. If, if you don't know anything about Almaty, Kazakhstan, which I didn't know anything about it till I literally landed here, um, it's a really modern city. Like, in the first three days of being here, I had, some, like, amazing Indian food, decent Tex-Mex, which I can't even get in parts of Europe. Uh, we had Korean barbecue last night. We had, like, it, it's a very modern city. Like, you know, I would compare it to, like, a Kansas City, maybe, or, like, a... Uh, Oklahoma City in terms of like there's everything there that you'd want to do it's just people outside of it don't know that much about it how did you fall in love with Kazakhstan so I first came here in 2013 um, and I actually started my trip off in Astana which is the capital Um, so Almaty used to be the capital until I think it was about 1997 and then the government here decided to um, move it up north there's different speculation of why but I mean like the one that you constantly read over is there can be earthquakes here Um, so whether whether that's the reasoning or not I don't know Um, but yeah so they moved the capital up into the middle of the steppe in Astana up north closer to Russia. And, um, yeah, so I, I went there first. It wasn't my favorite city. Um, I just didn't connect with it. It's a newer city. It's very, very young. Uh, there's, there's not the type of architecture I'm into personally there. Uh, so then I popped down to Almaty after, and I just really, really, really loved this area. There's, um, there's different layers of architecture. It's quite a dynamic city. Uh, it's got so many misconceptions about it that I can't even, I don't even know where to begin. It's hard to even think about it as having misconceptions. I I don't know if people have, like a lot of Westerners have conceptions about it. Like, like what do people even know about it? When you, when you meet someone and you tell them you're hanging out in Albany. What do they even say to you? Um, when I tell people I'm in Kazakhstan, of course, they still say Borat, yeah. um, which was filmed in Romania. And so it's, it's <laughs> yeah, it came out in 2006. And I mean, it's people are so poorly um, educated about this region of the world that I think there was a sporting event somewhere and Kazakhstan was in it. And they played the national anthem from Borat, which was not the real national anthem. Oh. So 
So it's just, I mean, people just don't know. Um, so until people start seeing pictures of it, I mean, when I first came here, um, my parents didn't know anything about it. And then when I moved here a little bit later in 2016, my mom is like, why are you there? And I was like, well, it's actually quite modern. So I sent her a picture. She's like, that's Kazakhstan. So it's just kind of, um, we have it somehow planted in our heads that it's either associated with Borat or those last four letters that it ends with Stan and that it's got a bunch of, you know, a high terrorist activity. It's not like that at all. Um, this city to me feels very European to an extent. And then as soon as you get outside the city, you feel like you're in some weird foreign land or like Mars, even the, the landscapes are just quite frankly sick. It's awesome. Um, so it's, yeah, I fell in love with it. Just, it's just a different place. Um, there's a lot to be discovered here. And, uh, I really, really just like the people. Um, they're a bit hard to get to know at first, but once you get to know them, they're just so grateful to have a tourist here and they really like showing off their city. And, Interestingly enough, everybody in Kazakhstan loves Almaty. So, I mean, not everybody likes every city in this uh, country, but everybody in Kazakhstan always talks very highly of Almaty, and and it's not hard to see why. So, um, if a traveler was going to come to Kazakhstan, well, here actually, there's a couple things I think people should know about Kazakhstan that people that I just like didn't think about. It's the ninth largest country in the world. So if you think about like Canada, the United States, Russia, Brazil, like the largest countries on the planet and how much you know about them. And then you get to Kazakhstan and most people like probably can tell you zero to three things about the country, but it's the largest country in the world. It's one of the only countries in the world that's ever gone through a true denuclearization process because it inherited um, all, uh, not all, but a large part of the Soviet Union's nukes. And they literally had to, after the fall of the Soviet Union, they gave them back. So if you think about countries not giving up nu nuclear programs now, Kazakhstan actually gave nukes back. And then another thing that I think is just really interesting about this place is that for such a large country, and it has a lot of oil money, um, it doesn't really have the feel of a country that's trying to only be wealthy off oil. Like, I know that that is something that they have to deal with, but it, there's more, there's a lot more emphasis on culture than there is always in just an oil country. Now we're not in an oil city. The oil fields are in the West, but, um, if, so, if a traveler was going to come to Kazakhstan for the first time, what would you kind of suggest they spend their time doing? Um, you know, I still have so much to see this country and I've, I've spent, you know, over half of a year of my life living here, um, various times and traveling through here. Um, I would definitely start in Almaty and let that kind of give you the feel. Cause I think Almaty is kind of the best of everything. Um, you have history here, you have museums, you have art, you have, um, the mountains, you have the step, you just, you have everything here and you're only five hours, um, on a marshrutka, which is like a mini bus from Bishkek. So it's not an inaccessible place to have to travel to. Um, so I think Almaty like has a massive opportunity opportunity for tourism that is not really been seen yet. Uh, it's more and more on like people's you know minds these days than it ever has been, but it's still, I mean, people are in Bishkek and they don't even think to pop up here and it's only a quick marsh route right away. And it's a very different city than Bishkek. Um, not in a good or bad way. It's just, it's very different. So I would say to definitely start here. Um, I would do a lot of exploring of the nature here because you know, Almaty is a city. It's not overly chaotic like some other cities that I've been to um, in post-Soviet countries like Tbilisi, but it, it is a city and it does have a little bit of pollution. And there are mountains here that are some of the most amazing places that have some of the most amazing places you would ever see. So I definitely recommend coming at least here for a week, um, seeing a little bit of the steps, seeing a little bit of the mountains, seeing a bit of the city, and then depending on what you like, moving about. So if you're really into modern architecture, um, head up to Astana. They also have the uh, National Museum up there, uh, and it's got some really, really cool artifacts and some really cool findings, because, uh, I mean, this is one of the most historical places in the world um, and one of the most historically important places in the world, especially because of the Silk Road. So a lot of those findings are actually up in Astana. Uh, if you're really into desert and like different type of life, head west. Um, if you're really into the old like Silk Road history, head to Shimkent. Um, it's got like also some pilgrimage sites around there, like Turkestan. Uh, so there's definitely 
I mean, there's a little bit something for everybody here. The biggest problem you have here and the biggest challenge is, like Stephanie said, it is the ninth largest country in the world. So you're not just going to pop on a day trip, you know, um, across the country. It's just not going to happen. It takes days. You drive across a step that, you know, in my opinion, probably compares to the Australian outback. There's nothing there for days. Um, but it is, I mean, you can fly, not necessarily great for the environment to keep doing that, but there are really cheap flights in between cities here. So that is an option. And, um, there are trains, but the trains, uh, tend to be a bit slower. Uh, but are, they are working on building a faster network. So you can get to Austin now um, from Almaty on a 12-hour train instead of the old school 24-hour one, which you can still do if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> so for people who like Soviet history and want to see remnants of the Soviet Union while those still exist, because now that we're getting to the point where we're like 30 years beyond the fall of the Soviet Union, some of that stuff is being lost. If somebody wanted to come here specifically to look for Soviet history, where would you suggest they go? Um, well, if you have money, I would suggest going to Baikonur um, out in the middle of the uh, desert and steppe. It's the city that was, and it still is closed, um, and Russia more or less owns it. But it's um, where they do the space shuttle launches. And um, so that's where all the history of the Soviet space program began. And actually still today, not a lot of people know this, it's the only place in the world that manned shuttles can take off. So all the American astronauts that are going into space, they come to Baikonur. Um, the problem is, in order to visit it, you need to go through a tour, and you have to have a specialized visa, um, and it's upwards of like a thousand or more. Um, so, if you're really looking for a piece of Soviet history, highly recommend doing that. Um, I haven't done it yet, but hopefully one day it's on my my wish list. Um, but here in Almaty, I think is probably one of the best places to see a bit of like Soviet architecture. Um, so here, I mean, you have you have so many pieces of Soviet history. You have, um, you know like wedding palace the the old soviet circus which is still in existence um i'm not going to talk more about that but um that's still in existence you have um all kinds of massive buildings they've renamed them so that they have no soviet association um but they still exist uh also, if you go towards the north, you do see um, some of those cities have kind of been um, revitalized and made a bit more modern. But you still have cities like Stepnogorsk, which I'm actually heading to next week or the week after, was known as a nuclear and biochemical site. And it was it had the most biochemical um, weapons in the entire world at one point during the Soviet Union. So. I mean, there's places like that that exist all throughout the country. Um, this, I mean, there's so much open space here that the Soviet Union used it to its advantage. Um, so I would say that those are, uh, Almaty is a good place for Soviet architecture. Uh, you can find it almost anywhere, but I would say that this is a big hub for it. And there's actually um, some really cool tours that you can take around the city with um, an American guy named Dennis Keene. And he'll take you through his tours called Walking Almaty, and they're very bespoke. You can take tailor them and he has plenty of Soviet tours. So if you come here, that's something that you can look into um, to get a taste of that old culture here. And what would you say is the biggest mistake that people make when they plan a trip to Kazakhstan? Well, if they plan a trip to Kazakhstan, they're already going in the right direction. <laughs> but I would say that the biggest mistake is that they they come and they just do the typical things and then they do nothing else. Um, they also tend to like... Wait, what are the typical things people do in Kazakhstan? <laughs> they just literally come to Almaty and they go around and they go to Charon Canyon and then they go to Big Almaty Lake and then they leave usually. Um, but I think that people here don't talk to the people or the people that visit here don't actually talk to the locals. Um, they're curious. It's a really diverse city. Um, um, so just, you know, from meets the eye, you might just look and everybody looks pretty similar, but they're actually not. They're coming from different um, backgrounds. A lot of them have different history. They ended up here during the Soviet Union. Um, so you have Armenian villages right outside of the city, like things like that. Um, you have Jewish villages. So there's different reasons why people ended up here. But I think like people want to talk. Um, the English is... It leaves a little bit to be desired, but in Almaty itself, you can almost speak to anybody that's a little bit younger, and especially a lot of the older people like that do speak English. They want to use it, and they want to speak to you, and they really like talking, and I think people come here, and they like they go to visit the pretty nature, and then some of the Soviet architecture, and then they just leave, and they don't, they don't ever meet anybody here, but the people here, they want to be your friend, and every time I leave here, I have like 50 to 100 new Facebook friends <laughs> of people here, and it's really, really nice because 
because it's just uh, they want to meet people and they don't all the people here don't always have an opportunity to travel outside of Kazakhstan yet. Um, so, you know, coming here, talk to them. They, you know, they need a visa to visit you, but you don't probably need a visa to visit them these days. And uh, they love meeting people. And where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on my blog. It's meganstar.com. Um, and yeah, so I write a lot about Kazakhstan and um, some of the old, uh, the other post-Soviet countries as well. And Megan also is one of the moderators for the Facebook group, Travel the Eastern, Travel Eastern Europe, the Balkans, and the former USSR, which if you're interested in going to any really post- communist country in Europe or Central Asia is, is it's like a treasure trove of information. Like if I want to know, like I literally posted last week where are prescription prices cheaper, Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan and got like people with like educated opinions about the differences. So if you're, if you're planning a trip to Ukraine, Armenia, Latvia, Russia, like Kazakhstan, Bulgaria, join that group. It's, it's really fun. And, and some of the coolest people on Facebook are in it. So Megan, thank you so much for coming back. Thank you for having me. And I'm sorry if my voice sounds a bit funny, but, uh, I'm on the mend. So all is well. we're going to go get Indian food. We're going to go get, did we decide an Indian? I, or we're going to go get some, some lunch, but, uh, I'm sorry, Plov and Central Asian food. Like, uh, Central Asian food is good. It's just a bit heavy. So you can, um, if you're not used to it, like it's hard to eat it every single day. So it's nice to change it up. And quite frankly, one of the reasons we love Almaty is it is international and you can do that. So we're going to go get some good food. And um, thanks guys so much for listening. <laughs>